What's up, Green Bay Packers fans? Welcome back, and as always, thank you for joining me. My name is Paul Bretto. Today, we're here to break down the Green Bay Packers' final injury report with what you need to know and the potential impact it could all have on Sunday's must-win game in Minnesota. But first, hit like on the video, hit subscribe on the YouTube channel. I do greatly appreciate it. Follow all my work over at Packers Wire, and you can find me on Twitter at Paul underscore Bretto. So like I said, on Friday, Green Bay Packers, as always, released their final injury report with injury designations ahead of their de facto playoff game against the Minnesota Vikings. So we're here to go through that, break it down, take a look at the potential impact on Sunday's game. So first, let's start with the wide receiver position. Christian Watson is listed as doubtful. Dontavian Wicks is listed as questionable. Both players missed Wednesday and Thursday practices. Uh, following that Thursday practice, Matt LaFleur did say that if there was likely any hope that either player was going to be available on Sunday, they were going to have to be on the practice field on Friday. Christian Watson was not. Dontavian Wicks was, but as Matt LaFleur put it, it was a very limited fashion. So it sounds like Wicks' status is very much up in the air, a game-time decision. Matt LaFleur said there will be conversations over the next few days between him, Wicks, the medical staff, and then he'll be put through a workout on Sunday, see how he's feeling, how he responds, as he's still dealing with that chest injury that he sustained uh, this past Sunday against Carolina. Obviously, we hope Dontavian Wicks can be out on the football field. I mean, he's become a go-to option for, for Jordan Love. Uh, no one on this team can separate from a route running standpoint from his release at the line of scrimmage, quite like Dontavian Wicks can, has this sixth sense of finding space in the in the defense's soft spot, which has led to him being one of the, you know, that coupled with his ability to create separation. He's been one of the best among all receivers this season in terms of picking up yards after the catch. So of course we hope Dontavian Wicks can be out there. But if he can't, or if even if he does, this game feels to me like a potential big time Jaden Reed game. And obviously more of that playmaking burden is going to be on his shoulders if the Packers are without Dontavian Wicks. This is a Vikings defense that blitzes at the highest rate in football. They blitz on nearly 49% of their defensive snaps this season. That for the Packers isn't anything new though. In their last six games alone, they face six opponents who all rank in the top 14 in terms of blitz rate, including four within the top eight. You know, Sean Ryan said there's some comfortability and the uncomfortability of handling blitz heavy teams. And what he means by that is, you know, because they've gone through this gauntlet of facing so many blitzing teams, they're prepared for it. They, they understand what's coming. They know how to react. They, they have the communication aspect down pretty well. And while each team has its own wrinkles in terms of how they blitz, where they blitz, all those different aspects, at the end of the day, blitzing is blitzing. And so this Packers team has been exposed to it quite a bit, and not just in the last six weeks, but this season as a whole. And this offensive line, Jordan Love, they've held up well against it. During that six-week stretch, Jordan Love is the most blitz quarterback in football, according to Pro Football Focus. However, he also ranks 12th in terms of dropbacks from a clean pocket. Nearly 67% of Jordan Love's dropbacks during that six-week span are from a clean pocket. And again, that ranks 12th in all football, despite being the most blitz quarterback. So the offensive line, for the most part, has held up well. That starts with the communication. That starts with Josh Myers. And I know, you know, obviously more so early on, the middle portion of the season, especially over the summer, Josh Myers' play was, you know, come under scrutiny. But one of the the aspects that he brings to this team, and we've heard the floor talk about it, Adam Stenovich has gone on about it a few times. Luke Buckkiss, the offensive line coach, is his leadership role in that offensive line room and the communication aspect of it. And when you're going against blitz heavy teams, pointing that out, making sure the entire offensive line is on the same page and knowing their responsibilities, that's obviously really, really crucial. From Jordan Love's perspective, Tom Clements, the quarterback's coach, has given him a lot of credit in recent weeks in terms of his growth, his development in handling those pressures pre-snap, changing or making the, the protection adjustments at the line of scrimmage being a better decision maker in terms of getting rid of the ball, uh, getting it to his check down, knowing where his outlets are for in those instances when the pressure is closing in or maybe when that downfield opportunity isn't available. So all of that goes into this team being successful against the blitz. And like I said, for the most part, they've been able to do that. Collectively this season, Jordan Love, when blitzed, has completed 67% of his passes at 7.6 yards per pass attempt with four touchdowns to just one interception. 
if the Packers can, again, continue that trend, holding up against a blitz, there's going to be opportunities in the passing game against this Viking secondary. For one, not just the Vikings, but any team, when you blitz, you know, you're leaving your secondary a bit exposed if you don't get home in time. There isn't that safety help over the top. There's one-on-one matchups, and the Green Bay Packers receivers in man coverage this season have been very, very good. On top of that, and circling back to where we started with all this, the potential for a Jaden Reed game, there's those one-on-one opportunities, and the Vikings are going to be without their slot cornerback, Byron Murphy. Uh, he's already been ruled out due to injury, and Josh Metellus, Cameron Bynum, the Vikings' next two players in terms of snap counts from the slot this season, both are safeties, both rank in the top three among the safety group in terms of yards allowed and receptions this season. So they have been susceptible in coverage to giving up those, again, catches, yards, opportunities. And of course, as we all know, that is primarily where Jane Reed plays from, from the slot. With that said, I wrote this article over at Packers Wire uh, this past week talking about Stenovich's comments on the depth of the wide receiver room. Big opportunity for Jaden Reed, of course, but Stenovich went on to say, and we've seen it this season, that this receiver room as a whole is the the deepest that he's seen you know, during his time here in Green Bay. And right now, this group is running six, seven players deep, if we include Samori Torre, in terms of players that the Packers are comfortable putting out on the field, players that have shown that when the ball comes their direction, they can make plays. And rewind just a few months ago back to august the receiver room with the youth with the inexperience was arguably i mean outside quarterback the biggest question mark on this packers team and now it's become one of the deepest you've had malik heath step up when needed both as a run blocker uh, as a pass catcher bo melton as of late making plays in the passing game got an opportunity behind the line of scrimmage against carolina again samori toure has had some opportunities sprinkled in here and there as well so and of course often forgot about this season, but Romeo Dobbs leads a team in targets, leads a team in touchdown grabs. Uh, He's been a steady, consistent presence for this Packers team. So not going to have Christian Watson, Dontavian Wicks, questionable again, very much seems like a game time decision, but for all the reasons just mentioned, uh, the matchup, the opportunities, I think this could end up being a a big game for Jaden Reed. And not that you want to forget about Aaron Jones, forget about the run game, But when we're comparing the Vikings defense versus Carolinas, I think it's going to be a lot more tough sledding on the ground game in terms of picking up yards. The Vikings are allowing just 3.7 yards per rush this season. They've held up well for the most part in that aspect. Again, you got to get Aaron Jones' touches. You don't want to become one-dimensional, predictable against a blitz-heavy defense. So the run game, of course, always has to be a part of the equation. But this feels like a game where the Packers could lean more towards the passing game And like I said, and for the reasons mentioned, could be a big opportunity for Jaden Reed. Next up, Luke Musgrave, Luke Tenuta, uh, Emmanuel Wilson, all three of them still on IR technically. All three have returned to practice. All three players are also also doubtful. Luke Tenuta, Emmanuel Wilson did practice in a full capacity all three days this week. Luke Musgrave was limited all three days. We would think if the Packers are going to get him back for the Bears game, that next week he's going to have to be a full participant for a majority of the week, if not all of it, to get back out there on the field. Adam Stenovich said that he looked good catching the ball. You can see his speed out there, but the pads haven't been on. He hasn't been out there in run blocking situations. And again, coming off a a severe injury as he had with the lacerated kidney, how he holds up, taking that contact, just the physicality of, of playing in a football game, are all you know things that are going to have that the team Musgrave everyone involved is going to have to be mindful of on his way back to trying to be on the field for for uh, week 18 against the Bears. Uh, Tenuta, uh, Emmanuel Wilson, again, same thing with Luke Musgrave. If they're going to be added back to the 53-man roster, a corresponding roster cut is going to have to be made. This week, technically, the Packers have an opening on the roster because Jair Alexander is on the reserve suspended list. But with Musgrave, Tenuta, Wilson being doubtful, we aren't going to see either of them added on to that roster spot. So once this week concludes, Jair will be back on to the 53. Packers will be at full capacity. So if going into week 18, the Packers do want to add any one of these three players, have them available for week 18, a corresponding cut or a player currently on the 53, that's dealing with an injury is going to have to be moved to IR to make room for them. Um, 
without Musgrave, the team's going to, of course, have to continue leaning on Tucker Craft. In the last four games, he's caught 15 passes, 218 yards, a touchdown, and he had seven targets. He led the team in targets against Carolina. He's, again, going to be a big factor, as he has been uh, against the Minnesota Vikings this week. <clears throat> Next up, TJ Slayton, Darnell Savage, both are listed as questionable. TJ Slayton's just provided a consistent, steady presence in the middle of that Packers defense. Out of all interior defensive linemen this season, he ranks fifth in run stops, and he's not someone, just given his role, given what he's asked to do, he's not someone who's going to fill the stat sheet every single week. But when he's out there, when he's playing at a high level, his presence is felt by that entire front seven. For one, when he's able to generate push up the middle, that's the best way, that's the quickest way to wreck any play, whether it's a run, whether it's a pass. He's someone in the middle who takes on double team, frees up opportunities for others. By taking on blocks, he's keep helping to keep the linebackers clean so they can flow, they can fill gaps, they can make tackles. Again, those things aren't always going to show up on the stat sheet, but they're incredibly important to the defense's success. Slayton was limited on Wednesday. He did not practice on Thursday, but was back out there Friday. And for what it's worth... He was uh, questionable going into the Panthers game, ended up playing, ended up being on the field for, I think it was 34 snaps. So we'll see uh, whether he's out there or not. Later this afternoon on Saturday is going to be a pretty uh, key tell as to whether he's going to be out there because Jonathan Ford, Chris Slayton are on the practice squad. And one would think that if TJ Slayton cannot go, one of them are going to be elevated because without TJ, Packers have only four interior defensive linemen on the 53-man roster. They've consistently used a a fifth <clears throat> rusher this or interior defender this season. And Jonathan Ford in particular is someone who can help fill those early down run defense snaps, which is obviously what TJ Slayton's role has been. So Saturday afternoon will give us a big tell as to whether or not TJ Slayton's going to be out there. But for the sake of this Packers defense, their defensive front, hopefully he can be. Uh, this isn't a Vikings team that wants to run the ball, even with all the inconsistencies at quarterback during the second half of the season you know they still rank 28th in rush attempts per game this season they're averaging just 3.9 yards per carry as you'd expect with the weapons that they have at receiver at tight end when when Hawkinson was available this is a team that wants to throw the ball and another added wrinkle that the Packers defense is now going to have to contend with we all know about Justin Jefferson you know, Jordan Addison, K.J. Osborne combined are almost at 1,400 receiving yards. Those two have 12 touchdowns on their own. Like, the Packers' pass defense is going to have their hands full, and we know that. And unfortunately, that unit's coming off some rough performances over the last few weeks. But in addition to all that, Jaron Hall, Vikings rookie quarterback, who's been named the starter, he brings a mobility element that this Packers' defense is absolutely going to have to worry about. And Matt LaFleur said it, I think it was on Thursday of this week, that that element at the quarterback position has given this Packers defense fits. You go back to week one, Justin Justin Her or excuse me, Justin Fields rushed for 59 yards. Justin Herbert in week 11 rushed for 73. Tommy DeVito, I think, rushed for 71. So mobile quarterbacks have given this Packers defense just this season alone in recent weeks fits. And it's going to take the the pass rush one doing their best to keep Hall in the pocket. And that starts with pressure up the middle. Again, the, the importance of having TJ Slayton out there. But it's also going to take disciplined, uh, the pass rushers being disciplined with their rushing lanes. Think back to that Giants game against Tommy DeVito. As Matt LaFleur said after the game, there are way too many flybys. The pass rushers were getting past Tommy DeVito in the pocket, which opened up these massive escape lanes for him to run through. He also took advantage of some designed runs for him off some read options, again, where the Green Bay edge rushers were just undisciplined, crashing in, and led to an, you know opportunities on the boundary for him to get outside. So keeping them in the pocket, when they have the opportunity to bring them down, they have to capitalize on those situations, and the Packers pass rushers are all going to have to be on the same page, can't be rushing individually, all have to have a game plan and have to be disciplined in how they go about it. Because if Hall is able to get outside the pocket, that's where he, that's where this Vikings offense is really going to be able to stress this Packers defense. For one, at that point, Justin Jefferson, Jordan Addison, K.J. Osborne, they're going off script. It's scramble drill mode. And, you know, that in itself is already a difficult task. But 
even if the Packers are able to remain sticky with that coverage, there's possibly in a lot of open grass or a lot of open field for Hall to take advantage of with his legs. Last week against the Panthers, we saw the pendulum swing from this typically zone-heavy Packers defense where they played man on 64% of their snaps, a season high. I think the pendulum is going to swing back towards that zone direction this week because of the opponent, because Jaron Hall has the ability to uh, pick up pick up yards with his legs because of his mobility. When you're in man coverage, your back's going to be turned to the quarterback. If he's taken off and you're watching, running with your receiver, you're not going to see what's happening in zone. Your eyes are going to be able to be, you're going to be facing forward. Your eyes are going to be on the quarterback. You're going to be able to see what's taking place. So that is another entirely different aspect that this Packers defense is going to have to account for this week and when it comes to Darnell Savage hopefully he can be back out there I think what's really really been missed and I mentioned this on my instant takeaways from last week's game I think what's really really been missed from Savage's presence on the field is that communication aspect on the back end getting everyone you know uh, locked in before in the right spot knowing what their responsibilities are before the snap of the ball. That's something that Matt LaFleur, safety's coach Ryan Downard, Joe Barry have all talked about and complimented Savage on since training camp, since summer. That's been a really key aspect to his contributions, not to mention the leadership role. There's been a few occasions where Matt LaFleur has gone, you know, on and on about what Savage has brought, not just in the defensive back room, but on the defensive side of the ball as a leader. And right now for a unit that's struggling, that presence could really, really be helpful in them. Savage, the safeties, who's ever out there at safety for the Packers, they're going to have a tough task this week. Uh, there's obviously the responsibility that comes on the back end, worrying about the the Vikings receivers in the passing game. But again, when you, when you add in that mobile element at the quarterback position, they're going to have to be mindful. They're going to have to be part of that. You know, it's their responsibility to go up and try to limit him, make plays, make tackles. And so for Darnell Savage, it's, you know, trusting his eyes, reading his keys and reacting appropriately and swiftly to hopefully limit any, any uh, running opportunities for Jaron Hall. Last up, uh, Devondre Campbell's listed as doubtful. He did not practice at all this week. As Matt LaFleur said a week ago, he had a conversation with Devondre Campbell, and they're just going to give him time right now to get healthy. We'll see if he returns this season. And then Robert Rochelle, uh, Packers cornerback, he's listed as questionable. You know, with Jair Alexander out this week, it's obviously going to be Eric Stokes, Carrington Valentine on the boundary. Corey Valentine is going to be the backup, but where Rochelle's role is going to be, if he's available, is going to be on special teams, which has been his primary responsibility this season. So there you have it, my friends. Those are my thoughts, the potential impact of what these injuries could have on the Green Bay Packers matchup with the Minnesota Vikings. As always, I appreciate you tuning in. Hit like on the video, hit subscribe on the YouTube channel. I greatly appreciate it. You can follow me on Twitter at Paul underscore Brettel, and you can find all my work over at Packers Wire. So until next time, friends, take care, stay safe, and as always, go Pack